Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Welcome to episode number two. This is the second ever episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Today, you're joining me for readings from indie author Patty Jansen. Patty has been an influential voice on keyboards, certainly, where I first encountered her, and also in the indie author community in general, specifically through her inclusion in and organization of large multi-author boxed sets. These are typically genre specific and they're very affordable. They're great ways to find new authors for you to experience. I'm gonna list a couple of those off really quick. I'm looking at Amazon, uh, but these are perma-free boxed sets, I believe. So they are most likely available on a number of other vendors. The first is entitled Galactic Empires, Eight Novels of Deep Space Adventure. And uh, those are sci-fi, and Patty has a title included in that. And she's also listed as one of the principal authors, so she helped organize that that free box set of sci-fi. And the second box set is Quest, Eight Novels of Fantasy, Myth, and Magic. And Patty has a fantasy title in that collection, which was organized by Lindsay Baroker and Jeffrey Poole. When I first approached Patty, who was very gracious about me reading from her work, I suggested that I read from the Icefire trilogy, which is a fantasy trilogy that I'm currently reading. <laughs> so I thought, hey, this will be great. I'm already enjoying this. I'll read it. She suggested that I read instead from her Ambassador series, uh, which is a sci fi series. And I don't begrudge her that one bit because science fiction is kind of having a moment in the indie market right now. I don't know how long it's going to last. It seems like 2016 was a big year for science fiction, certainly. Um, And you'll notice I'm just trying to get really good indie authors in these first few episodes, uh, people who are doing really well on Amazon specifically. But a lot of them are science fiction authors right now. (laughs) So we're reading a lot of science fiction which is fun if you're a fan like me. So today the title I'll be reading from, which is Ambassador Book One, Seeing Red. And by the way, she calls Ambassador a space opera thriller series. This is marked down for a 99 cent, looks like Kindle countdown deal right now. Um, So you should check this out. April 1st and 2nd, she's advertised the deal. It looks like it's already on right now. If you like what you hear, go grab the title. It's only 99 cents on Amazon right now. Now I'm going to read Patty's Amazon author bio. Patty lives in Sydney, Australia, and writes both science fiction and fantasy. Her best known works are the trilogies set in the Ice Fire world and the popular and addictive Ambassador series. She has published over 30 novels and has sold short stories to genre magazines such as Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Patty was trained as an agricultural scientist, and if you look closely at her stories, you will find bits of science sprinkled throughout. Want to keep up to date with Patty's fiction and get four books free? Join the mailing list at pattyjansen.com. Patty is on Twitter, at Patty Jansen, Facebook, LinkedIn, Goodreads, Library Thing, Google+, and blogs at http colon slash slash pattyjansen.com. 
So Patty's very active, as I said, in the community. She's also very active on social media, it looks like. Um, and as always, I'll be including links to her page as well as her page on Amazon in the show notes. One last thing I'd like to clarify, and that is that this reading does not come from the official audiobook. This is just my reading created just for this podcast. If you'd like to hear the rest of the book in audio form, please do go to the author's webpage or the author's Amazon author page to see if the audiobook is available. So, without any further ado, let's get to the reading. Ambassador, Book One, Seeing Red, by Patty Jansen. Chapter One. Diplomats at Nations of Earth often joked that when politics sank into a lull, something was about to explode. The greater the sense of we've got it all sorted out smugness, the bigger the bang. I was certainly far too comfortable, if jet-lagged and keen to get to my hotel, when I met President Sirkonen in his office in Rotterdam that afternoon. Nice and easy. I had received my commission from Gamra with all the final details, such as what time I needed to be at the exchange. And tickets, by themselves worth more than my annual earthly salary. Now I only needed the president's signature, and I would be off to my new job. Definitely too comfortable. I had never been on first-name terms with the president, but while I sat there trying hard not to succumb to jet lag, he chatted about my father, whom I had just visited, and who had finally retired from lunar base to his native New Zealand. Sirkinen opened the drawer of his desk and took something out, which he flipped across the gleaming wooden surface. I could do nothing but catch it. A data stick. I turned it over. The black plastic cover reflected the sunlight. What's on it? You might find it useful. Think of it as some personal advice from me to you. We'll talk about it later when you return for your first briefing. He shut the drawer with a thud, as if closing the subject. This was highly irregular. Mr. President, can I ask... He shook his head and offered me a drink. Finnish vodka, best in the world, he said. While he poured, his hands trembled. I should have insisted that he tell me what was wrong, but who was I? An unimportant, sending out our feelers type of diplomat, expendable in twenty years his junior. Not the type of person to draw attention to his problems, with alcohol or otherwise. We made a toast. The heavy scent of the vodka did nothing to improve my alertness. Mr. Wilson... When you come back in six months' time, you must present your report to the General Assembly. We need to know in detail what sort of regimes we're dealing with. I didn't understand why he spoke in such empty generalities. I wondered when he was going to open that folder on his desk and sign the contract. Nika, my coldy assistant, was waiting in the foyer. We had a whole heap of work to catch up on. I was annoyed that Sirkinen had changed our meeting time at the last minute. The original meeting had been scheduled for tomorrow morning. Sirkinen stopped speaking. I stared at him, realizing with embarrassment that I'd been off with the fairies. Was I meant to have said something? Was I breaking rule number one of the diplomatic circle? Never show any sign of sleep deprivation? An attack of dizziness overtook me. My vision wavered, as if the world were painted on a silk flag that flapped in the wind, and all the furniture was rimmed in a red aura. Mr. President, I'm... I just managed to put my vodka down. The glass hit the wood with a soft clunk, the only sound 
in the frozen silence. There was a small sound from outside. A click. As if stung, Sirkanen turned to the window. His eyes widened. Sir? The president opened his mouth, but a sharp crack interrupted his words. I didn't think. I dived off the chair into the hollow of safety under the desk. The room exploded. Glass shattered. Wood splintered. Something crashed on top of me. The world went black. Purple spots danced before my eyes. An alarm blared, sounding woolly through the ringing in my ears. What the fuck? Footsteps thudded in the foyer. The door burst open, crashed into the wall. People ran in, many of them. Boots crunched over debris. The air exploded with voices. Mr. President! Mr. President! I squinted through half-closed eyes. I lay in a cocoon of semi-darkness pinned down by something jagged that hurt my back, too heavy to push off. My head echoed with unfamiliar silence. Nika? Somewhere in the room, someone groaned, a voice that wasn't Nika's. A man called out, He's over here! Get a doctor! Now! Replies blared through calm units. I tried again, picturing the thought sensor patches in my brain. Nika? There was no reply, not even when I commanded the link to open completely. Yet Nika had been waiting in the foyer, well within the feeder's range. I lifted a hand to the back of my head. My fingertips met my scalp, spreading slick wetness in my hair. Blood. I could smell it. Of course, I'd handed my feeder in before I came into the president's office. The president's office? An explosion. Bloody hell. Sir? A male voice much closer. The pressure on my back eased. And then, help me get this off. The pressure lifted. I rolled onto my side, blinking against light that angled into the room from an unusual source. A large hole gaped in the wall where the window had been, the edges like jagged teeth of bricks and mortar. Through it, dusk-tinged clouds looked obscenely peaceful. The room itself was a mess of glass, plaster, and splintered wood. A woman knelt by my side, in the uniform of the Nations of Earth forces, but with a red collar that said, Special Operations. Are you all right, sir? I sat up, rolling my tongue in my mouth. Dust crunched beneath my teeth. I... I think so. My head pounded. Blood dripped from a cutting board of slashes across my palms. Shards of thick glass littered the carpet, the same shatterproof security glass which was used in spacefaring vessels supposedly unbreakable. There were also fragments of the vodka glass, wet stains of the vodka itself, mixed with plaster from the ceiling, paper, and books, those priceless 400-year-old volumes that had filled the shelves in the president's office. And amongst all that mess, copper-dark smears of blood. Mine, I presumed. The voice that drifted from the other side of the wrecked desk was weak, but 
unmistakably Sirkinen's. No, no, you don't have to. I can... I don't think so, Mr. President. You're injured. The President was alive. I was alive. No idea what the hell had just happened, other than that I was simply alive and glad of it. The guard helped me to my feet and sat me down on the President's sofa, my palms dripping blood on four hundred year old furniture. I managed a week. My hands. Looking at them made me feel sick. Everything made me feel sick. We'll get another ambulance out in a minute. But I didn't want an ambulance. I panicked voices. He's losing consciousness. People ran across the room. Two paramedics in orange overalls wheeled in a stretcher. Someone flung a towel in my lap, which I wound around my bleeding hands as best I could. The embroidered Nations of Earth symbol ended up on the outside. Emergency crew lifted President Sirkinen onto the stretcher, his shirt ripped and wet with blood. They covered him with a silver blanket and put a mask over his face. The president tried to wave it away, his movement feeble. His Scandinavian tanned skin had gone very pale. Keep still, Mr. President. We'll have you in the hospital very soon. Then they were out the door. A different guard, male, sat down next to me. You're Mr. Corey Wilson, Union Delegate? I nodded. Normally I would have corrected him. Gamera, not Union. But that seemed a trivial, pedantic issue right now. I might work for Gamera, the organization that governed the exchange, the means of interstellar travel, but right now I faced him as a fellow human. And without the input from my feeder, I felt this even more keenly. Our president had been attacked, and my job was another world, literally. I'm sorry, sir. I need to ask some questions. Did you see anything? No, just the window exploded. A feeling niggled in the back of my head. I couldn't see outside. There was a curtain. It now lay mangled on the floor. Then I remembered. Sirkinen saw something just before it hit. Was it even an explosion? There'd been no fire. Just wavering air and a red aura surrounding everything. No, that was probably because I was exhausted and my brain still operating on New Zealand time. I rubbed my face with the top of my wrist. Where is Nika? A puzzled look crossed the man's face. My Zema. He was waiting in the foyer. The frown deepened. Um, sir, are you speaking Isla? I was, wasn't I? Eight years of full-time training in Coldy, and I was no longer sure. The wrong language had the habit of slipping out when I was off guard and tired. Someone else behind my back said, there was a person in the foyer, sir. I couldn't be sure about the gender. Union? The other guard asked. I had the feeling he would have liked to have used the derogatory word ethy from extraterrestrial humanoid. Yes. I said, he's my assistant. I need him here. A small silence, and then... I'll go and see, sir. Thank you. I leaned back on the couch. 
I hadn't liked that silence. Not at all. Nico was all right, wasn't he? If not, I needed to get him to the exchange immediately. Coldy bodies differed from ours in much more than their hair with iridescent highlights, purple, blue, and green like a peacock, or their muscular build. While they could vary their body temperature, they reacted badly to hypothermia, meaning anything below 40 Celsius. I imagined an emergency crew working on Nika, giving him the wrong blood, not keeping him warm enough. The thought made me shiver. I had lived with Nika for four years, spent most of my waking and sleeping hours with him as part of the Jema concept. In the rigid, hierarchical Koldi society, he was my equal, my companion, the other half of my job, my pillar, my hand that reached out to the many peoples of Gamra. He was the reason they would talk to me openly. He was my translator for those languages and customs I'd had no opportunity to learn. An interviewing journalist had asked me what a Jema was, and I'd explained it was like being married, but without the sex. But it was more. For Kaldi people, it was pathological. They did everything in pairs of two. Why had I been so stupid as to leave Nika in the foyer or hand in my feeder? President's orders. Simple as that. Uniformed personnel with guns crouched over the debris near the window. Red collars on their shirts betrayed that they all worked for special services, and they, I remembered, were the spying division of the armed forces. Two of them sat on their knees, waving scanning chips over the debris. Damn expensive equipment that was. Nanotechnology from the glory time before the wars. Way too expensive to produce these days. Snatches of conversation drifted across the room. Like a bomb being thrown into the window. Sure? He says Sirkinen saw something. I have to get that on record. Where was Nika? I struggled to the edge of the couch, tested my legs, and then rose carefully to tap one of the uniformed men on the back. The man turned. Sit down, please, sir. He, too, wore the emblem of the special services branch. Another said, Ambulance is on its way. I'm sorry, I... I need to speak to my... assistant. I was more careful with language this time. Coldy words upset too many people. He's in the foyer. I know. He's being interrogated. Interrogated? I need to speak to him. Not yet, sir. You shouldn't interrogate him until I speak to him. There was a flicker of hesitation on his face. Maybe he heard the anger I tried to keep from my voice. Sir, there has just been an attack on the president. We need to... I understand, but Nika Palai falls exclusively under Gamera law. If you wish to interrogate him, you can apply to your local Gamera delegate which happens to be me. Now, I will grant that permission because I understand that you need to speak to all possible witnesses and I have no desire to withhold information. However, I want to see him first. I would also appreciate it if my feeder could be returned and my security staff were brought up here. They're at the security post downstairs. Goodness knew what those two young men had been subjected to. How bewildered and lost they must feel. They spoke some Isla, but with poor fluency. 
The man snapped into a military salute. Sir. He turned on his heel and marched out of the room, no doubt to get a higher-ranked officer. He didn't return. Two guards asked to search me. In my pocket, they found the data stick the president had given me. One guard turned it over. The black plastic surface reflected the light. What's on it? I don't know. I wished to hell I knew. I'll need to make a copy. I'd rather you didn't. The investigating team will need to study every object present in this room. It's most likely information pertaining to my job. I've had no opportunity to look at it. It might contain material sensitive to Gamera interests. He raised his eyebrows, like he wanted to say, The President has been attacked. Isn't that more important than extraterrestrials? I assure you, sir, all material we collect is confidential. I nodded, by no means assured. But what could I do? Refuse and be treated as suspicious? He took the data stick to a colleague at the door. Shit. Sirkinen had given this thing to me, not to be pried at by special services. He had been talking about Seymour Kershaw, my predecessor of sorts, who had disappeared at Gamra headquarters in Baresh ten years ago. Now some idiot had made the story into a movie which accused the Koldi, the dominant ethnicity within those sections of the galaxy serviced by Gamera, of killing him. I hoped the information wasn't about Kershaw. The connection between it and the fictional allegations in the movie would be all too easy to make. I could hear the questions from the press. Why didn't these aliens allow Earth investigators to see for themselves what had happened to their ambassador? Why did they keep such tight control on their precious exchange so that smart humans couldn't travel to other worlds and infect them with undesirable ideas like democracy and religion? And I could explain as much as I wanted because Gamera is familiar with the consequences of allowing different species to pursue their jurisdiction across interstellar space. It rarely ends well. Because you cannot translate law from one species to the other. And no one on Earth would listen to me. Eight years of working with Gamera, and I thought I was beginning to understand. Yet, the main thing I understood was that these people might be our biological cousins on the human family tree, separated by 50,000 years, or more, of isolation. But their physiology and mental hardwiring differed so much from ours that Earth hadn't even begun to understand. I believed we desperately needed to set the incident aside and move on. Because that's what Gamera did, drowning conflicts in bureaucracy, because it was the only way to keep the exchange network functioning in peace. I got the data stick back, and managed to work it into my pockets with the bloodied towel. Shit. Sirens wailed outside, but the promised ambulance didn't come, or, if it did, was diverted elsewhere. Military hovercraft zoomed backwards and forwards across the part of the sky visible through the hole in the wall. I was sore. I was tired, barely having slept since my father had driven me to the airport in Auckland 36 hours ago. I was hungry. I still clutched the filthy towel around my hands. I caught the attention of a young special services officer. I thought it was the one I had asked about Nika before, but 
all faces blurred in my mind. Look, I've been sitting here long enough. I asked to see my assistant. Where is he? Sorry, sir. I asked the boss, but he must have been held up. And fuck you, too. Ask him again. I... I swallowed the words. No. Complaining wasn't going to gain me any points. I need medical care. His cheeks went red. Sorry, sir. He went out. What the hell was going on here? I expected this kind of obtuse past the buckery at Gamera. They were good at that. I had not expected this kind of treatment here, in Rotterdam, at Nations of Earth. Oh, blow their restrictions. I wriggled one hand out of the towel. Pieces of glass glistened in deep cuts, which still oozed blood. I smeared it on my jacket as I fished in the pocket for my comm unit. Ouch! Ouch! and Ouch! Contrary to security regulations inside the president's office, I turned the unit on. It beeped. Not Nika. The ID told me that much. Ava? Corey, there's been an attack on the president! The female voice with the Polish accent brought a wave of longing, of safety, of roast dinners with glasses of wine, and the distinctive smell of nicotine-free tobacco from her father's pipe. I know. I'm in his office. His... but you weren't meant to see him until tomorrow. There was a change of plans. Oh, Cory. She burst into tears. Ava, please. I forced my voice into the calmest tone I could muster. I'm fine. Tell your parents, but right now I need to call... The connection went dead. A uniformed figure stood before me, flipping shut an electronic device. Sorry, sir. No communication from this office. He, too, belonged to special services. I want to talk to my assistant. Can you return my feeder? It's in a basket on the secretary's desk. I've been sitting here for a long time. Gamra will be asking questions about me. And if you don't let me go now, I'll give you more shit than you've ever seen in your life. I'll go and see, sir. He also vanished out the door that yawned like a portal to freedom. Then a different man in uniform came in. Mr. Wilson, come with me, please. Are you taking me to my assistant? Follow me, please. Where are we going? Out. Stupid question, Mr. Wilson. Out was a definite improvement on wait here, so I stumbled to my feet, intending to give him an earful as soon as I faced a part of him that wasn't his uniformed back. Waiting in the foyer was a female ambulance officer with a first aid kit. Hers was the first smile that greeted me for hours. The anger seeped away. Are you in much pain, sir? Not that bad. The pain had subsided into a dull throbbing, but the muscles in my hands were getting stiff. I was shivering, in need of infusion to counter the effects of my adaptation treatment. That medication and equipment was in my hotel room. I glanced into the hall through the open doors, but saw no sign of Nika, my guards, or my feeder. She made me sit in the secretary's chair and took the towel off my hands. One look, a grimace of her lips. This will have to be treated, I'm afraid. I need to find my assistant. 
Nika had to be going crazy without me. Her face turned serious. You need surgery to remove all the glass from your hands, sir. But my assistant! And my feeder! And my guards! I glanced at my bloodied palms, repressing a shivering surge of nausea. She was right. I think she saw that realization in my face. Her tone softened. Come, sir, I'm sure your assistant is in safe hands. You should worry about yourself now. You're injured and in shock. She clipped her case shut and helped me up. The hall and the stairways crawled with servicemen, nations of earth, special services, National Guard, and ordinary police, all of them bristling with guns. The two-story-high space hummed with voices in Isla, as well as Gaelic, Frisian, and Neo-Germanic, an unintelligible mush of languages, new and old. My guardian angel shouted, Out of the way! Out of the way! Ambulance personnel coming through! Men in uniforms shuffled aside, leaving some semblance of a path to the door, where an ambulance with flashing lights waited. Neither Nika nor my security guards were within sight. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash benjamindouglasbooks.wordpress.com. And of course, if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show, or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook, feel free to contact me at benjamindouglasbooks at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend.